by the way, I'm still thinking of, we, we need to think of talk about how driveline is helping you make your own lane because that was a great bit yesterday when we yeah. had a discussion. And I think we need to talk about branding that and how to get that shared out because I love yeah, that. I, mean, I love that thing. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that's definitely, like, I've been thinking about that and, like, you know, uh, it, it just kind of, like, speaks to what the function of the app is in its current space. Like, you can actually say, like, okay, so this is this is my route. This is my this is my domain. This is my leaderboard. You know, we create a leaderboard for these uh, specific drives, and the most popular ones get promoted. That's that's that to me is like what it, what it's about. It's like you're like okay, so we have a de facto like racetrack, you know, by my house. I mean, without without it being a racetrack. No, Driveline does not promote street racing in any way, shape, or form, and we are against it. We do, not, we do not award points for speed, but for activity. But disclaimer. Aesthetically speaking, <laughs> what would it look, what would a what would a point system based off of time look like? Allegedly, yeah, it would look really really bad, and we would get sued in a matter of hours. <laughs> like, like I actually am pretty sure the cops would show up. Like literally. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I'm positive of that. I, I'm absolutely positive of that. Though I still love the, uh, you know, we do have the driveline um, secret test track, which is just south of Route 15, north of Stanford. If you come to, if you get to the synchrony uh, corporate office building, you've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> which is Are just a lap around a, a uh, parking lot. <laughs> yeah, parking lot. Uh, parking, you know, it was in an office park. It's an office park loop. Um, but it's perfect for that. But that's where you want to go be stupid on a Sunday morning when there are no, there's nothing to hit. Exactly. Like, not other cars or people. No, I, I know what you mean. Uh, speaking of uh, racing, uh, I, I recently saw this movie called uh, uh, First Man, which was about uh, which was about Neil Armstrong. And they had to, they had a couple scenes in the big uh, salt uh, salt flats. Oh, nice! In the desert, what are what's required in order to to be able to drive out on there? Like, is it a special permit you have to get? Like, what does that look like? Because that's that's beautiful desert out there. No, with the salt flats, you can just show up with for like for Bonneville and things like that. You, I believe, you can just show up. You just have to sign up in advance with any with like just a regular street car. That'd be awesome. Show up and a helmet. <laughs> That's it. Uh, because it's what you need is based on the speed you want to achieve. Really? Yeah. So I'm assuming there's no speed limits. No, 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 no. Um, it would be if you're if you have an unmod. I believe if you have like an unmodified car. That's just like a street car. So even if it's a Bugatti or something like that, you are allowed to take it out there and drive it on the salt flats as long as you sign up in advance. You Fill out all the registration forms, and I and I believe that you if you require a helmet, but I think it might be for a street car you might not even need a helmet, uh, just because it's you you know it's you're not going any faster than you could, and actually on the salt no car can actually achieve its true top speed because the the salt is actually quite grippy, so really? there's enough drag on the wheels where you're not going to ever reach your uh, you're never going to go as fast as the car can actually go. So is that one of the reasons why those uh, jet-powered racers have such thin tires? I would assume so. I would assume so. It probably also weight and like everything else involved. So I was just wondering, like the BMW i8, you know, that's that electric BMW uh, concoction. Oh, wow. That actually has very thin tires for the size of the car. So you want to talk about a car that's actually a great used car purchase. Look them up uh, on like Auto Trader. You can get really killer deals on uh, BMW i8. Like forty, fifty grand will get you a lightly used BMW yeah. i8. That's great. But uh, being that it is a first generation electric car, I'm assuming there's quite a few uh, headaches involved with maintenance for those type of cars. So actually. Interestingly enough, that car is, has more in common with my Volt than it does with the Tesla. Really? 
Yes. So you're, what you have is you have a battery, and you have a four-cylinder gasoline motor that is primarily a generator, and you're driving on the electric motors, but based on the charge and the gasoline generator. So you've got as much range as you want. You can just keep filling that car up. Just drive your car. I'm not going to lie. When they first unveiled that car back in 2012, I want to say, that was one of the, like, I was, I was like a kid in a candy store looking at that, uh, looking at the body styling of that. I'm like, wow, we are actually in the future. The concept car was a lot better than the reality of what that car ended up being. Yeah, but it, it, yeah exactly. I mean, but to be honest, it's a very, I, I think that this is going to be one of those uh, cars that, you know, uh, 20, 30 years down the line, this is going to have like a higher resale value, like a higher collector uh, 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 view. Yeah, but, uh, but I think that? that's what makes it a good move now is that you can get into them. I mean, new, there were like 110. Oh, really? Now you can buy a used one for 40, 50 grand. It's still, it looks like an exotic supercar. It, they're not slow. It, it's essentially, you get the nice scissor doors. I love that. That's, is, that's why you get it. Yeah, it, but it gets you all the, but, and here's the funny bit, though. Electric cars, they have fewer moving parts than a gas than a gasoline car. You are not going to have the same maintenance concerns on it. Uh, what's interesting, and I've, I've noticed this with the, uh, with the Volt, the oil change interval on that car is really, really long. And the reason is that the... Despite, even though you have that gasoline motor generating, spinning and generating electricity, it doesn't have the same stresses that, let's say, a regular engine does that's pushing the car along because there's no resistance, right? It doesn't, the engine doesn't hook up to a transmission that then has to overcome inertia, to push the car forward. It just spins freely and generates electricity. That electricity then in turn is what is sent to the electric motors. Those deal with all the resistance. The new ones are actually close to like 150 to 200 grand. Yeah. That's so crazy. that's even better. Buying a used one for your fifty thousand dollars is actually quite good. Yeah, I really like the stylings of the uh, of the convertible. Mm. Okay, so let's let's since we're on the topic of electric uh, roadsters, what are your top uh, top five or top three uh, electric uh, two door coupes? That one, that's it. That that's the one I want. If you would take that over the Tesla. Yes. Yeah. You would take that over the Fisker. Well, the Tesla's not even out yet. The new Tesla. Oh yeah. Um, I'm gonna forget the old one. The new one. That one's not available yet to buy. The Fisker's not. The Fisker is. The Fisker. Was it a coupe or was it, was it four doors? I believe. It had a, it was a four door. Yeah, that new test looks amazing. Uh, but I don't know. It's I'm kind of big on the idea of a practical electric car, and then I, that way it gives me an excuse to buy more old gasoline powered cars. You know me. I like the, I like old cars. I, I want something that's not gonna help me, and if I get into an accident, I'm just dead. I, I want something that comes up in a ball of fire. Speaking of that, I mean the the issue with old cars is uh, is a safety concern. I mean you you heard about Kevin Hart just got a a really crazy accident uh, with with an old uh, Barracuda, like a '70s Barracuda, and he had uh, he he was uh, in, in the hospital, had to go to rehab center. Like the the issue with that is like if you get into an accident with those old cars, they didn't their crumple zone the their their idea of a crumple zone was a fucking uh, beer can. <laughs> No, look, it, it, it's those those cars are definitely riskier, but the difference is, is you're not driving them everywhere, and you're probably not usually driving them on busy city streets. I think the problem is in California, you live in California, and you lived out there, yep. people, you can daily a car from the 60s or the 70s. It just, it's possible in California. 
I so, mean, you really, you really look cool. I'm not gonna lie. Like you have, a, you have like a '60s, '70s car. You got a convertible going down by the beach, man. There, there's no uh, better part of life. Actually, did you, did you ever hear about you know, you know who, you know Lady Gaga. You know she, she yeah. has a thing for like '70s and '80s shitbox cars. Really? Yeah, like um, Camaros and Firebirds and El Caminos and old and like. Five like fox body mustangs. She buys them, doesn't garage them, and she lives right by the beach. So she just leaves them out, and they just rust away. And then, but she buys like absolute shit boxes and just. Oh yeah, I mean I've seen a couple a uh, couple of her cars. She's got a old uh, uh, Chevelle SS that looks pretty sweet. I love those Thunderbirds. Speaking of Thunderbirds, uh, I think that uh, the the Thunderbird that came out in what, like 2004, 2005, that's going to be one of those cars that really maintains its value going forward. Really? Oh no! I, I you know, I, they're you classic, know, they're unique cars, but they're not good cars. Unique does not necessarily mean good. The only thing that had going for it is it has the same motor as the Jag XK8. Is that a, is that a benefit? <laughs> like, it, was, it was a decent engine. Yeah, a decent engine, but not quick. Not well, quick. Well, I mean, like I don't think the the Thunderbird was designed to be quick. But I mean, I don't know. Like when I when they first came out, I absolutely hated them. I saw one recently, and I actually like it. It was it was an interesting, weird look to the car. I think it, I think it will uh, uh, maintain its value. I'll, I'll go so far as saying that, it, like you know, in 10, 20 years, it will actually be more valuable. So I think they look good if you get rid of the terrible wheels and bring them down about an inch. I think they sit way too high off the ground, and I think the wheels are are like these terrible chromies that they came straight from the factory with, and it's just it's not a good look. But the, the body sill just sits too high off the ground, and they did that because they knew what the buyer the buyer was was you know. 60 years old and didn't want to like careen into a low slung car. I think if you bring it down about an inch, it'll look awesome. Now, speaking of unique, but not great, like uh, unique cars that are ugly or like horrible. What are your thoughts on the Chevrolet SS model? Okay. So I've driven the, Oh, I drove one of those in Australia when it was still, the Holden Commodore. We're so, talking about the same car, that two-door weird truck uh, hybrid, right? Oh, no, 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 no. You, oh, you're talking about the SSR. Yeah. You have the, the, the Chevy SS, which they were selling up until recently here, and that's the Holden Commodore in Australia. Yeah, no, that that was, that was a good one. Yeah. I'm talking about the SSR. My, my neighbor has one of those. It's... It, it's it's not good. No, it's not. It's, it's, not, sorry, man. it's just not good. Who de- who designed that? It almost looked like a like a Chip Foose uh, unholy concoction. Uh, you know, and Chip Foose does great work, so I know it's not him. No, I wouldn't say it's Chip Foose. <laughs> well, who was the um? Well, look, it, I have no idea who designed that car, but let's talk about bad design decisions here. The Buick Riviera, the one that I got from you. Well, yeah. Not from you, from your sister. Yeah. That one, the person who designed that car is the same person who designed the 1967 Pontiac Trans Am, which is a gorgeous car, gorgeous car, and or 67 or 69, I forget which one. And that guy designed the car that looks like a suppository. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a positive. Okay, fine, vibrant. It looks like a, it looks like a, it looks like a, a bargain basement sex toy. <laughs> and once, once, and and here's the problem: everyone who hears this, and next time you see it, all you're gonna be able to see is vibrator. Every time you look at it, not going on, that's all you can see. Every time you rev the engine, you see the head like start to start to shake a little bit. That thing is. Such a piece of shit. Okay, like, I mean, it was the heights of 1990s technology. I mean, it had heated seats. 
you know, uh, power windows. It, it had a turbo. It had no, blue leather. This, mind you, you're talking about the deluxe edition. Yes. That no, it actually had the supercharge as a supercharger, but not the one I bought from you. The one yeah. I bought from you does not have the supercharger on it. It. That is, <laughs> is not the good. Well, well, actually, what's really funny is if you look inside the car, there's a transmission tunnel. There's a drive shaft tunnel that runs the length of the car. So if you look at the back seat, there's a, like a hump in the middle. Yeah. And there's, it's even in the middle, too. Usually, that only exists in a rear-wheel drive car, right? Because yeah. the reason you have that is to run a drive shaft. Yeah. But the Buick Riviera that I got from you guys is a front-wheel drive car. Which means at some point in the design of that car, they had intended it to be a rear-wheel drive machine. And what they did is they instead turned the engine sideways and made it front-wheel drive and terrible. I mean, that was a design decision for sure. I mean, the, 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 you also overfilled it with oil. So that's why there's always oil dripping out the front end of the of – the, um, of the valve covers, we because it was leaking out. So I bought new valve covers, pulled them off, and you know to replace the gasket. Yeah. And like, why is there a big pool of oil in the in, in inside the valve cover? There's not supposed to be. If you do that with the vet, you just see a little bit of oil because that's yeah. all there's supposed to be there. The reason that thing leaks oil out onto the header, and that's why the thing smokes, by the way, it's yeah. not actually a problem with the. We thought it was an exhaust leak or something like that. No. It's just the oil leaking out of the valve cover onto the end, onto the um, engine and the uh, exhaust manifold. So it's just a little bit of oil. It was nothing, uh, nothing, nothing crazy. Yes, no, but the real problem is still trying to figure out how to fix your windshield, those windshield wipers. Yeah, so we looked into that. The issue was there. It was an electronic switch in the actual uh, drive shaft. And the issue with uh, with that is because of the 1990s car, car, they don't actually make any electronic switches for the drive shaft for viewers. So what we would have to do, at least this is what the mechanic told me, and you can refute it or not, uh, is we would have to find a junk Buick that had a uh, rivier, that had a drive shaft that we could actually take out and yeah. replace the whole thing with. See, I don't think it was a drive shaft. I think it was the um, you mean the steering column. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I went on to Rock Auto, and uh, you got you can actually buy that new stock because it's the switch is actually inside the stock where where you turn the windshield wiper on and off. Yeah, that's where it's broken. So it's just a matter of disconnecting it and pulling that out. That particular uh, control was in about fifteen different. Chevy models over like a 30 year period. So this is uh this is a teachable moment and make sure you get the right mechanic on your team because if you don't, they will take advantage. Yeah, yeah. You know, look, you gotta know to do your own research. Where when they tell you something, it's like, uh, let me get a second opinion on that. So this is actually a good segue uh for for us right now. So Let's say you buy one of these, these classic cars that you uh, – not necessarily even a classic car, but a car that's uh, interesting, that's older, it's not well-known, um, you know, and there, there's uh, some mechanical stuff wrong with it. It's the first car you're getting into. What do you – what what's your approach? What do you want to, like uh, inter- – like, how do you want to interview a mechanic to make sure that you're getting the right one? Like, what what's your what's your mentality in doing your internet-based research to, <laughs> to finding out about more about the, the car you just purchased? So I think that one of the easiest, one of the best tricks to is to just kind of literally just start Google searching that particular car and looking for parts. Um, one of the best, one of the things I like to do is go to Summit Racing and Rock Auto, which are great you know, big parts dealers, and just seeing what is available, right? If the, you can find lots of parts for the thing, well, you may not be, it may not be as risky, right? Because working on the Mercedes mm-hmm. right, that I bought. That, there's the 450 SL, the 450 motor, and the 560, they made thousands of cars with, tens of thousands of cars with that 
uh, probably even a hundred, over 100,000 cars with that particular engine in it. Not that particular model, but Mercedes is a big manufacturer. They make lots of stuff. Yeah. So I think – so when you start researching, you go, okay, the blower motor. Does that require a lot of manual intervention? Is it going to be something I have to search for? No, apparently Rock Auto has brand new ones for $35. <laughs> so if somebody gets on and says, oh, this is a hard part to find, it's like, bullshit. Give me the part number. Actually, that's always the best thing. When somebody says, we're going to have to order this part, you, and they give you a number, say, well, give me the part number. Because if you go on and you go on – so for, uh, I think the best example of this is the uh, power steering pump for a um, Austin Martin V8 Vantage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That part actually is the same power steering pump and water pump for both of them come out of a Ford F-250 pickup truck. Same part. Yeah. You get the Austin Martin version, you know, $800. Yeah. If you want the Ford F two fifty version, two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> they fit. No difference in the bolt holes. It's just what's printed on the side of the of the pump. <laughs> Get the Ford part because yeah. the truth is, is that had Ford. That most of that engine is Ford. Most of the car companies are lazy. They buy a lot of stuff from other companies. It's just efficiency of construction. You know, you're not going to design this stuff new from the get-go. So in which case, you probably buy from other manufacturers. You know, that it's funny you bring that up. Uh, when I, I was listening to an interview that uh, Elon Musk uh, gave when he was first designing the uh, Roadster, and they had that same approach of where of going to all these uh, third-party uh, manufacturers to get a lot of their parts made. Like, given the nature of like, you know, like electronic drivetrains, they actually ended up having to design and build a lot of the parts themselves. Right. But the car itself, they just called Lotus and said, can you send us the body? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Right, man, well, I got to, I got to bounce. I got to get back to my Sunday. Um, okay. But I think this was great. We'll do this again. I think. I agree. Before, like, before you uh, go, I have one more weird car I want you to uh, bring up. Sure. What do you what do you think about a 1999 Plymouth Prowler? I'm I'm going I'm going to stop this conversation now while I still respect you. <laughs> That's what I'm going to leave. I'm bringing up the weirdest, ugliest cars I can find. All right, take care, man.